Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Knowing the Father. And we have seen how God the Father sent His Son into this world to reveal the Father to all of us. But we've also seen that the greatest revelation of the Father's heart of love is the cross. And once again, we are in an area which is so full of mystery. Many people ask, how could God abandon His Son on the cross? Well, the answer to that is that Jesus was not abandoned for His own sin. He was abandoned for your sin and my sin. And when Jesus yielded himself to the Father on the cross, he was speaking from within the heart of humanity a yes on behalf of us all, which now means that all the no's we've said to God are cancelled and that our no's are struck out so that we in Christ are able to say yes to God. This is an amazing mystery and it's a wonderful revelation that Jesus Christ has stood where you and I stand and as he's yielded his life as a sacrifice for sin, we now are no longer abandoned by God as our sins deserve, but we now can come to know him personally and intimately as God the Father. Let's see then why did Jesus have to die? Whenever the gracious love and initiative of the Father in redemption is missed or misunderstood, then the Father's love is inevitably slandered and we are robbed of a key element of our, of our assurance. Listen to this. Sadly, in many Christian traditions, there are believers who think that they must hide behind the gentle love of Jesus to be saved from the only just contained wrath of a still angry father. It's hard for them to revel in their wonderful status as sons and daughters of the all-loving father. But the New Testament makes it plain that the Father is the gracious initiator of redemption. It was all his idea. It was his plan. It was his provision. Mark 14, 27, then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. It was God's idea. Romans 8, verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not along with him also freely give us all things? 1 John 4, 9 to 10. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son in the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Oh no, the cross is all about the initiative of the Father's love. We would not even know what love was if God hadn't first loved us and sent Jesus to be the one who turns away his wrath. That's what the word propitiation means. Of course, elsewhere in the New Testament, it is stressed that Jesus gave his life voluntarily. It was a voluntary sacrifice. 1 Timothy 2 verse 6, He who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Hebrews 9 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So it was a voluntary self-sacrifice of Jesus. And we know that the Father and the Son share the same nature and that the Son expresses the Father's identity in the world. And so it should no longer surprise us that the Father gave his Son and the Son freely gave himself. There is a unity, a cooperation, a working together in the plan of salvation. 
But in that unity and cooperation, there is at that point, perhaps clearer than anywhere else, the revelation of the Father heart of God and the revelation of the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father did not make the Son endure an ordeal he was unwilling to bear, and the Son did not surprise the Father by his sacrifice on the cross. This again is a, another paradox which is neatly expressed in Galatians 1 verse 5, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Or in John, 17, John 10 verses 17 to 18, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own, lay it down of myself, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And so, of course, it is the John 3.16 revelation. It is God's will, and the Son is in submission to God's will. This is a plan of, of partnership. It's almost as if the Father said, this is the way to redeem mankind. Son, are you willing to go? And the Son says, Father, I'm willing to go, and they have an agreement. And, of course, the Holy Spirit's involved there because that Hebrew passage says, he offered himself without spot through the eternal Spirit. Jesus depended upon the Holy Spirit to help him through into that point of sacrifice. So, and here is something that's so very important. These words are already underlined in my copy of the manual. The, this means we must recognize that the love and grace of the Father are not the result of redemption. They are the source of it, its origin, its motivation, even its precondition. I mean that the obedience of the Son in Gethsemane and on the cross is merely a response to the love-filled will of the Father. We need to keep reminding ourselves about this if we appreciate the Father's love for us and rejoice in His fatherhood. In other words, the cross did not make God love us and look kindly upon us. The cross was an expression of God's love, His mercy, and His kindness. That's the basis of your assurance. If you want to know how you are saved, look at the cross. If you want to know whether God loves you, look at the cross. Jesus didn't persuade God to love you at the cross. The cross was God's loving provision carried out by Jesus at the cross. Oh, we've got to understand that the cross is the Father's activity. And until we see the cross in terms of the Father's activity, we will never understand God's fatherhood and our relationship to Him as Father. And again, if we think of the Father, Son, and Spirit as separate individuals, we will inevitably caricature Calvary as either God punishing an innocent Jesus, a third party, or Jesus persuading a reluctant father. But the New Testament establishes that our redemption was not achieved by Christ alone or by the Father alone, but by the Father acting in and through the Son with His full agreement. They worked in harmony. Their wills were one and they would not be separated. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19 makes this clear. Now all things are of God who has reconciled to himself, reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespass, trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. It was God in Christ reconciling us to himself. And also, perhaps, it is the essential unity of the Godhead that could suggest that God himself died for us. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, it talks about crucifying the Lord of glory. But you see, God's immortality shows that he could not have died he had to become human in the person of his son. 
and from that place deal with God's judgment. And at that place, God the Father would dispense and receive his own divine judgment. This means that redemption must be the Father's activity, but it also must be God acting as human. In other words, it's got to be the God-man. The one who obeys the Father on our behalf must be fully, fully human. The yes must be spoken from within humanity because it was a human no that led to the abandonment. So the one who obeys the Father on our behalf must be fully human so that his righteousness may be imputed to us to become our righteousness or else his obedience and death are irrelevant to us. But also, the one who carries this must also be fully divine, or else his acceptance of abandonment would not make a scrap of difference. You see, this is the truth of passages like Romans 8 verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak, through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And 1 John 4 verse 10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. And there are three reasons why redemption must be the father's action. Number one, because of human incapacity. We know that's because of sin, it's impossible for us to accomplish our own redemption, even with the help of the Spirit, because we need that sin to be dealt with. We need that no to be reversed to yes, so that the abandonment could become acceptance. Ephesians 2 verse 1 describes our fallen nature. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And the rest of the second chapter of Ephesians describes the terrible plight that mankind is in. Children of wrath, our nature is given over to wrath. How can even that nature, even though it helped by the Holy Spirit, come to salvation? No, we can never save ourselves. And the kind of changes that are necessary, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, those who are in Christ are new creatures. John 3, 7, being born again. These are simply not the results of human effort, fallen human effort. No, the whole of the New Testament teaches us that there is no human work that can meet God's perfect requirements. This means that redemption must be the Father's activity and, can, and we can benefit only for what is done for us by the Father through the Son. And the more we recognize human sinful incapacity, the more we realize the need for the Father to work redemption through incarnation. Nothing else will ever make any kind of sense. Secondly, it needs to be the Father's work because of divine grace. Redemption is an act of grace. By definition, this means that redemption must be an action which is performed completely and exclusively and totally by God himself. That's what redemption is. God saving us. All of God. Not of us. There's not even a tiny bit that we contribute to our salvation. Otherwise, it would not be God's salvation. It wouldn't be God's grace. You must understand that there can be no grace if the Father sends someone else other than himself to accomplish our redemption. That wouldn't be grace because it wouldn't be God's free gift. It would be somebody else's work. Even a man filled to the Spirit to the nth degree is other than God in his essence. And his actions could only point to a divine attitude. His actions could never point to divine action. So if it was to be God doing the work, it had to be God manifested in the flesh. 
So it would be God's actions, not just an attitude that pointed to God or actions that pointed to God, but the attitude and actions of God himself. For redemption to be a work of grace, it simply must be the Father who brings it about. So now we can see that for this to be possible, it requires both a triune God and an incarnation. It's this act of grace which negates the charge of injustice. You know, some people have said, no, this is absolutely wrong. It's unfair of God to punish a third party if, if you're guilty and God's punishing somebody else, that's not fair. Would you like to be punished by somebody for somebody else's offense? But they overlook the fact that it is not a third party. It is God himself who is receiving the punishment. God didn't send another. God came himself in the person of his son. And also, that son came as a voluntary sacrifice. He provided the sacrifice and he became the sacrifice. So from far from the cross being an injustice, the cross is a demonstration of God's righteousness and his infinite grace. Then also we need to see that this has to be the Father's activity in order for the eternal consequences of this, of this cross to hold good. The New Testament represents Christ's death as possessing eternal consequences. It's on a par with creation and the final judgment in the revelation of God. And the events of the, of the cross affect the destiny of the whole universe and of every person in it. Every person. For those who believe, it affects their salvation. And for those who reject, that cross seals their condemnation because there is no other way. So cro the cross is not only the supreme revelation of God's glory and nature, it is that. The cross is also an action which changes everything. On behalf of all men and women, the Father in and through the Son reconstitutes humanity's relationship with himself. The cross is eternally effective as the Father's redeeming action for humanity, and therefore it demands a response from all people. The cross has changed humanity's situation in such a total way that everyone must come to terms with it. And it has eternal consequences. We must accept this great change and do it by faith and recognize that in that only the Father can bring it about. If redemption is as significant as creation and, judge, and, and judgment, only the creator and judge could achieve it by becoming human in his Son to be the Savior of the world. Well, what then is the Father's outcome here. What, what does the cross mean to the Father? And that's a very important question to ask. Most people don't get beyond the fact that the cross deals essentially with human sin. But the cross deals much more with the Father than it does with us. The cross was the sacrifice of Jesus, of himself, to the Father. The cross is orientated towards God the Father. The Father is offering himself as a sacrifice to the Father on account of God's wrath. On the cross, Jesus deals with more than us. He deals with the Father. He offers on our behalf the obedient acceptance which fulfills the Father's will that's the yes, and it bears the Father's judgment. That's the reversing of the abandonment. Jesus suffers the Father's abandonment, offers the trust and love which correspond exactly with the Father. He commends his work into the Father's hands and awaits 
His verdict. The focus is on the Father at every point. Suffering the Father's abandonment, offering the love and trust which correspond to the Father's will, commends His work into the Father's hand and waits His verdict. What will He do? Well, look how the Father responds to the cross. He accepts the obedient Son who has exhausted His judgment against sin he acknowledges that his son has done this on our behalf and then releases the Holy Spirit to work out in us all our personal rebirths and new creations. John 16 verse 7 is a very strong verse in this respect because it shows that the son must first go to the father before the spirit can come and work out his new creation in us. The father is the focus of the cross and the outcome of redemption is entirely his. It's the father's outcome. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus is saying here, I must first Go to the Father before I can send the Spirit to you. And that meant he must first go to the cross and suffer the shame and rejection of the cross and suffer, suffer the pain and agony of the abandonment of the Father in order then to speak God's yes on our behalf. And to hear on our behalf, God's yes spoken over all mankind when God raised him from the dead. He was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Oh. The Father is the focus of the cross and the outcome of redemption is entirely his. Now this should minister to you the deepest assurance you could ever know. It's clear that the Father's acceptance of the Son is the Father's acceptance of us who believe in him. So our redemption does not depend upon our feelings of acceptance, it depends upon the facts of Christ's acceptance. If your assurance depends on your feelings about forgiveness, you won't feel forgiven when the times are tough or when your emotions are down and you will wonder whether you are forgiven because you don't feel forgiven. But if your confidence in the cross does not depend on your feelings, if it depends upon the fact that God has said yes to the Son and raised Him from the dead and received Him into heaven and released the Spirit into the church, then your assurance will never waver. This means that your assurance will not rest and should not rest. It cannot rest on your subjective feelings about forgiveness, I feel forgiven, I feel loved, or anything like that but it rests in the objective fact of the resurrection of the Christ who died, which is the Father's yes to the Son and to his work and on behalf of all those for whom Jesus died and was raised. This tells us, my friends, that your assurance does not rest on anything in yourself. Hear me, listen to me so carefully now, because this will change your life. Your assurance of salvation does not rest on anything in yourself, on anything that you feel, anything that you think, anything that you do. Your assurance rests entirely on what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior. So never look to yourself to be assured of your salvation. Are there enough good works here? to prove that I'm saved? How many good works do you need to prove that you're saved? One, 
two, three, a hundred, three hundred. All those who tell you, look to yourself to see if you're producing fruit in order to prove whether you are saved or not. They are fundamentally at error at this point. Your assurance does not rest on anything in yourself, not even your own obedience. Your assurance rests on this one thing. It's the obedience of the Son of the Father's love. So you don't look to yourself for assurance. You look to Christ. You look to the cross. It does not depend on anything in yourself. Not on anything in your mind, your emotions, your will, not your actions, your behavior, your performance, past, present, or future. Your assurance rests on this sole thing, what God has accomplished for you through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anything less than this is simply not grace. Salvation is all of God. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Because Jesus only has paid the price. He's spoken the yes on our behalf. And his yes becomes our yes. And God has accepted him. And his acceptance is our acceptance. We are accepted by God in the well-beloved Son of the Lord Jesus, Son who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the outcome of the cross is not that it has prompted God to love us a bit more because he's always loved us with an infinite love. It's not that the cross has turned God into a father for he's been a father throughout all eternity. Rather, it's that through the cross, the father has become my father. And it's for this that we give him unceasing praise and thanks. And it's this that motivates us to live forever in the father's arms. Hallelujah. Well, that's the end of this session. We're going to come back to this point in the next session and go further into understanding how the father felt when he saw his son die on the cross. God bless you until the next session.